For our very topical next segment on global health, we focus on virus hunters. Here to moderate is the program director, Global Health Program, Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, Suzanne Murray. Hi, I'm Dr. Suzanne Murray from the Smithsonian Global, Global Health Team. I'm honored to moderate this panel today of uh, distinguished scientists and vi virus hunters. Today, we're gonna present the full spectrum of um, scientists from different areas that will show the multidisciplinary approach and the successes associated with that. The three folks that I have the pleasure of introducing are one, Dr. Neil Aziz, the head wildlife pathologist from Smithsonian National Zoo. Dr. James Hassel, um, a veterinary epidemiologist from the Smithsonian's Global Health Team at Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, and Dr. Peter Daszak, the, Eco, the president of EcoHealth Alliance and also board member of the Global Virome Project. Uh, to jump right in right away, Neil, the first question is for you. Would you be able to tell us the, um, what a veterinary pathologist does and why that, that role is important in diagnosing illnesses in animals? Uh, um, yes, Suzanne, a veterinary pathologist is a veterinary laboratory diagnostician that is trained in understanding uh, veterinary uh, diseases at the gross and cellular level. Um, so what we do is that we examine um, what we can call a, a post-mortem examination, or you think about a human coroner, and we're examining uh, an animal from start to finish. And after we perform the post-mortem examination, we examine the tissues under the microscope um, and we look for uh, cellular alterations. Can you tell me if this has any implications for wildlife and or human health? Okay, so in the concept of One Health, uh, when we talk about environmental health, human health, and veterinary health, um, veterinary pathologist is very important as we talk about diseases that are zoonotic. Um, a lot of uh, infamous zoonotic diseases, I'll name just a few, avian influenza, West Nile virus. Um, we can even talk about some very high infectious agents such as uh, anthrax. Um, so what we do as veterinary pathologists is that at the cellular level, we determine whether this is an infectious disease. Uh, we can help guide the diagnostics of this tissue. And then from there, we can alert the uh, clinical veterinarians, public health veterinarians, and then human uh, health, public health uh, doctors to uh, an, uh, an outbreak or to a diagnosis of a zoonotic disease. Thank you for that. And uh, James, the next question is for you. Can you tell us um, why animals are in the, in the wild are a source of uh, new infections for humans? Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. So uh, I think we have a pretty good idea of why why there are so many novel viruses in wildlife. And it actually comes down to some basic principles of, um, of ecology. So it's helpful to think about this in terms of how natural systems are structured and, and their biodiversity. And by biodiversity, we're talking about the number of different species present in an ecosystem. So the places that um, we tend to think of as being very biodiverse, such as uh, rainforests in South America or, or for example, savannas in Africa are home to lots of different species. And over the course of millions of years of evolution, these, these wildlife species have evolved with their own um, sets of viruses, some of which, some of which may be common um, and shared widely with other species and some more unique. So as a result, in areas where you find a high diversity of wildlife, you would also expect to find um, a high diversity of viruses too. And in terms of why, why the number of viruses, or why none of these are able to infect humans, I think it's, it's important to, to remember and remain, cog uh, um, remain cognizant that um, our ancestors and their livestock started out in these environments as part of this wildlife community. And as such, um, wildlife have probably been the original source of most, if not all, of, of our viruses. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, can you tell us a, a little bit about how this relates to current pandemics? So what's causing the pandemics and is it just the wildlife trade or is there something else that's, that's uh, contributing? Yeah, thanks, I think, I think it's a really good question. It's quite complicated. So, so to understand why pandemics are becoming more likely, I think it, it's 
it's helpful to look at firstly the reasons why um, people interact with wildlife, um, and secondly, how these interactions are changing. So, so yes, consuming wild animals or having them um, as pets puts you at a high risk of being exposed to their viruses. But there are other ways um, that people can be exposed. For example, through harvesting of um, of bat guano or close contact with livestock that can act as intermediaries between wildlife and humans. Um, and many of these are actually things that people have been doing for for thousands of years, but the real difference um, is that today these human interactions with wildlife are taking place um, against a backdrop of quite unprecedented incursions into nature in the form of the deforestation, um, road building um, and agricultural development. So when this is combined with human population growth and all social changes like globalization, um, as a result, you, you, you end up with much higher levels of um, connectivity between that original reservoir of viruses in wildlife, the people who are interacting with wildlife and their products and, and the rest of us. Um, and what that means if you're a virus is that upon entering a human um, for the first time, you have at your disposal many more susceptible people to infect. So I think it's really that connectivity that makes it much more likely that um, a single spillover event anywhere in the world will result in a pandemic. Mm, interesting. Thank you. Um, we uh, we've uh, I think many of us have heard the stats that about seventy five percent of these emerging infectious diseases come from the wildlife population first and then spill over into the human population. Can you tell us what's being done today in that arena? Yeah, and I think um, the answer is that quite is a lot, and there's actually a lot to be um, optimistic about, although. Um, that's a difficult thing to say in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I think to be able to appreciate the progress that's been made, it helps to put our efforts into, into perspective. So um, it wasn't until the early 2000s that scientists who were studying wildlife disease, um, and one of those people was Peter, who's on this panel, um, actually realized that there was an increasing trend in viral spillover from wildlife to people. So given how little we knew about these issues 20 years ago, we've actually come a really long way. And this is thanks to um, a global effort to firstly identify new viruses in wildlife, um, secondly, study and raise awareness of how people come into contact with them, um, and then actually develop capacity for countries to be able to, um, to monitor um, these threats as, um, as, as they're occurring. So in terms of specific examples, there's, I mean, there's some great research out there that's being done around the world, but one of the most coordinated and I think it would be fair to say thorough efforts to describe viral diversity in wildlife um, and how people's behavior can expose them to these viruses has been the USAID funded um, PREDICT project. Um, and this, is, this has been an effort between universities in the US, including our team here at the Smithsonian and, and EcoHealth Alliance, working with international health organizations and, and more than 30 governments around the world. Um, and not only has this effort identified more than a thousand novel viruses of the types that we know can infect humans, um, including over 150 new coronaviruses, but it's also it's allowed us to predict how many unknown viruses are, are present in that wildlife reservoir, um, in what species they're in, and um, and the geographic locations where, where we should be looking for them. That. Um... Uh, James, that's fascinating. It's actually the perfect lead in with the questions I wanted to ask of Peter. Peter, can, uh, given that um, your team, you've been part of the team that's been working on co um, coronaviruses, can you uh, help bridge to the current outbreak of, of COVID? Tell us a little bit more about where um, where the thought lies and how COVID, where and how COVID originated. Yeah, COVID is just like many other um, emerging diseases, Ebola, SARS, um, West Nile virus. Um, it's an animal origin virus. And um, when we look, we know that because when we look at the genetic sequence of the virus behind COVID-19, it's very closely related to a, a group of viruses from bats in Southeast Asia. So it probably came from a bat. That's probably the origin of the virus. Um, and we think it probably got into humans through either people exposed to bats as part of their everyday life in, in rural uh, China, Southeast Asia, 
all through the wildlife trade. And there's definitely some evidence that the wildlife trade at least is involved in amplifying the initial outbreak. Um, but yeah, this is yet another animal origin virus. And, and we estimate there are millions perhaps out there waiting to emerge. Um, given uh, how likely do you think it is that there there's a uh, that there will be another spillover or epidemic or a pandemic? Well, we've started tracking pandemics, uh, and we we've shown that they originate in things we call emerging disease events. Um, a spillover of a virus in a tropical rural area into a small population causing a small outbreak, and as you just heard, sometimes those can then become, uh, can spread and become pandemic. But every single spillover event needs to be tracked because any one of those could become pandemic. We've gone back over recent history and shown that they on the rise, that these events are happening with increasing frequency. Uh, and, and it looks to us like it's an exponential rise and it's directly related to the things that are causing them and our continued um, encroachment into wildlife habitat, which also is increasing in an exponential way. Mm, very interesting. Um, is there anything that we can do to prevent them from happening again in the future? Well, th I think the first thing we've got to do is realize that there is an underlying cause to pandemics and not just hope that we can design vaccines and, and deal with them. You know, a strategy for us should not be just sitting and waiting for the next one to happen, hoping to get a vaccine or a drug and that we can then deal with it. We need to look at the whole problem underlying pandemics. And if pandemics are part of our ecological footprint, if they're caused by you know, human activity around the world, and that's what the science is telling us, then we, I think we need to start trying to prevent them. How will we do that? Well, we can go to the places where pandemics are most likely to originate, emerging disease hotspots, usually in tropical or subtropical countries, with lots of people doing lots of things to the environment, like in Southeast Asia. We can work with communities that are on the front line of risk and help them design um, programs to change behavior that makes it a lower risk, whether that's hunting and eating wildlife, trading wildlife, farming, um, building roads into the forest. We can work with companies that are, that are part of that, that are doing this to, to economically expand the country's uh, welfare and, and talk to them about ways to do that in a more sustainable way. But above all, I think we here need to realize that we're connected to everywhere on the planet now by this incredible global network of travel and trade. We're also connected to pandemics because it's our consumption that drives the growth in, in developing countries that leads to pandemics, whether that's consumption of products from tropical forests, mines, um, livestock production, if we can all begin to be a little bit more sustainable, that will reduce the risk of future pandemics. And um, Peter, uh, James, Neil, this is really for anybody. In terms of thinking about, you know, sort of an optim, the, our, the, the good news in all of that. Um, James, you mentioned a little bit that we've already built, you know, we have some great news and some of the capacity we have built already. Do any of you have any, um, a, another silver lining to, to offer? Well, I'm going to jump in because I really do. And, and, you know, and right you now in the U.S. in the yeah, middle no. of this pandemic, yeah. but as, as I look outside and, and I see, you know, from my lockdown position, I see wildlife moving about without us. And we know that in, in parts of India, you can see the Himalayas clearly and crisply for the first time in years. We know that in Venice, you can see the bottom of the canals clearly. And it shows us that our, our footprint really does create lots of problems for us. It gives us a vision of a future that we can strive for when we come out of this pandemic. Thank you. I think the same thing as well. And um, I also wanted to, to, to say that, um, you know, even when we're in the middle of a, a humanitarian crisis, I think of how, uh, how bad it could have been if we hadn't done all this preparing ahead of time. 
And I also think that we are really stressing the ability, I mean, what what a multidisciplinary approach can do. More and more, we're all learning of opportunities and ways we can work together. And even this earth optimism, the fact that we can have all the expertise from all three of you on on a day like today so we can celebrate how much has gotten done and how much this is a call to bring the all of us back together. So in terms, uh, I wanted to thank each of you for um, for contributing your unique expertise, but also giving us some hope that we are making a lot of progress as we move as we move forward. And uh, and uh, so we, we have just another um, uh, a few more minutes left. Yes, well, thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Aziz, would you be able to comment upon or give us an example of a virus that has that veterinary pathologists have found? Uh, okay, Suzanne. Um, so we take we take a step back and we go back in time and think about West Nile virus. Um, that was diagnosed by uh, Dr. Tracy McNamara, who was a wildlife uh, a zoo pathologist up at the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York. Um, in conjunction with it, with it uh, being confirmed, she brought those tissues down to the Department of Defense pathologists who were stationed up at USAMRID, um, and uh, Dr. Nancy Jackson and company, include Dr. Uh, Keith Steele. Um, so they worked up on West Nile virus themselves. Um, and as far as veterinary pathologists, we have a very, very interesting role in diagnosing these diseases because we diagnose them on the front line um, and then we can also characterize them and, and be scientists, either a lead scientist or support scientist in um, studies and how we characterize the virus, how we understand its pathogenesis, and then providing a uh, framework or tissues to give off to the molecular uh, experts to you know get down into the genomic, the biologic genomics of the actual virus. Um, so when we start thinking about the Ebola, uh, which recently um, had big outbreaks in Africa, Dr. Nancy Jacks, who was a veterinary pathologist, is one of the premier scientists who worked on studying and characterizing that virus as well. So for us as a, a zoo or wildlife pathologist, we, right now we're really focusing on the uh, human and uh, wildlife or the wildlife and zoo animal or the wildlife and food animal interface. Um, and that role right there is where we are focusing on and um, you know, bringing hope by being steadily vigilant um, and diagnosing and doing a lot of surveillance on those diseases. So some of the big ones that we always uh, look out for, the, you know, West Nile, avian influenza, and of course, uh, Ebola. Yeah. And uh, Neil, thank you for that, because I think that also gives us a really good example of why the animals in, in our collection and the folks that care for them are so important, because we learn a lot about uh, animals under our care here at the National Zoo and SCBI, and then we can translate some of that information to our partnerships on the ground that, James, that you were speaking of. And then as we look into the future, um, what we're talking about with Peter and what we're hoping to do to prevent the next outbreak. Peter, we just have less, a little bit over a minute left, but would you mind making a comment on the Global Viron Project? We know that you're a, a member of the board of directors there. And uh, can you talk a little bit of what the, give us a, a little sound bite of what the future of virus hunting might look like? Yeah, I mean, we estimate there are about 1.7 million unknown viruses on the planet. In in the types of animals that pandemics have emerged from in the past, and of the types of viruses that have caused disease in people, um, now most of those probably wouldn't harm us if we got infected, but some of them could do, and some could be pandemic. So the Global Viron Project tries to identify those viruses before they emerge, before they become pandemics, And now it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to cost a lot of money. But look how much this one single pandemic has done. Trillions of dollars and incredible mortality rates. So we think it's worth it. We hope people get behind this and join the movement and try and prevent pandemics. Thank you for that. And thank all three of you. I think um, I'm very proud to uh, to know all of you, and I really appreciate all that uh, you guys do and how you represent your unique uh, specialties and what we do to make the earth a more optimistic place. I think if we can continue to, sp- to support your teams, we're really going to make some great headway. So thank you all so much for your time.